Thank you very much for the invitation and for the very flattering introduction. Um, so my slides up, good. Um, so the uh, the first thing I'm going to do is to try to explain the the words in um, in the title of the talk. And uh, the way I'm going to do it is not by explaining one by one, but but by um, going through an example that's hopefully. Um, that will hopefully indicate what things I will be looking for in, uh, um, in further examples in my talk. So the, um, the simple-minded picture on the left is supposed to picture a, uh, um, a game that people usually play with um, their kids when the kids are little, and that's building a tower out of standard blocks. So imagine that you are building a tower with, with standard blocks, and the blocks are scattered on the floor, and it takes a little bit of time for you to find the next block, and then once you find it, you put it on top. So the time it takes to put the next block is random a little bit. And I'll assume that the, there are plenty of boxes um, on the floor, so you don't need to go to the corner of the room, of, uh, of the room after a while to find a new one. So the, the process is roughly stationary in time. So you keep building the tower, and if you're good, the tower becomes pretty tall. So how tall is it going to be after a long enough time? Well, so um, as I said, that you have, if you have plenty of boxes, then in the first approximation, the growth is, um, is going to be linear. There is some speed with which things are growing. And so um, the height of the tower is going to be the speed times the time. Now, um, that's easy, but then the, the next question I want to ask is what, what are going to be the fluctuation around, uh, fluctuations around that predicted value? Okay, now the problem as stated probably is not quite well posed. I don't really give you enough information to mathematically solve this problem. But um, assume this is all you have. What are you going to do? Also, the, uh, the thing that, that uh, many people will try doing is, um, is um, come up with an example. So let's come up with an example. Let's, let's provide the information that, that, that wasn't given to us to, to solve this problem. So let's assume that we are building this tower of blocks in discrete time, and let's say every 30 seconds we either put a block on top or we don't put a block on top. And then happens with probability half. You know, we flip a coin and it either goes on top or it doesn't. Right? Okay, so then we, we wait a long time. Then we want to know what the height is going to be. Now the good thing about this, uh, this uh, simplification is that now one can compute everything. I can compute explicitly the probability distribution of the height after a certain time, and so the, the a, little, a little bit of exercising with, with combinatorics. To, okay, now I should teach myself not to use the laser pointer, which I was forbidden to. Um, and I'll try to handle this Stone Age device. Okay, so the, the probability of, um, uh, of having height equal to n after time t capital is given by that binomial coefficient divided by the power of 2. Okay. So and then if, if you know that, then with some uh, fairly elementary tools, um, you can see what this does at large time. And what it does at large time is um, it tells you that the height is going to be, in the first approximation, linear. The speed of growth is 1 half. And in the second approximation, it's going to be fluctuating on, this, on the scale of root of t. And if, moreover, you want to compute more exactly the probability that the height is going to be less or equal to the predicted value plus some fluctuation of size root t, then this is going to be the Gaussian integral or the area of the, or under the bell-shaped curve on the, the, the white part of it, I guess. And so this is, um, this is really an exercise, and that exercise has been done for the first time, to the best of our knowledge, by a person named De Moivre a long time ago, in the early 18th century. Then it was done independently by Laplace, slightly more generally. And so, um, the relate, what, so, okay, in this particular case we know everything. It seems. What does it tell you about what? What does it tell us about the original question? 
that would really simplify the, the, the problem so much that this computation doesn't, doesn't carry any information. Or maybe on the other hand, we, we, we haven't done anything bad. And the answer that, that we observed is going to apply to a large class of reasonable problems. And so that, um, you know, anybody who took a class of probability knows the answer to that. And the answer is that the example that, that, that I just showed actually carries all the essential information for the answer to the general problem. For a large variety of randomness that one can put on the process of putting boxes on top of each other, the fluctuations are always going to be of size, which is the boot of time. And the distribution of those fluctuations is going to be given by the, the Gaussian, the bell-shaped curve. So this is, this is um, known under various names. In math, the most common one is central limit theorem. Um, I will uh, try to use the, the name of the, uh, the, the name universality principle. So the universality principle is going to tell me that for a certain variety of, of models or problems or systems, the features that I observe don't really depend on inessential qualities of that system. Like in this example, the fact that I was adding a single box with probability half was really inessential. I could have, I could have taken a different recipe, but the answer would have been the same. The example that supplied me with the information I will refer to as an integrable example. The word integrable will really mean just, for the purpose of this talk, will just mean that this is an example I can solve by formulas or by, by something else reasonably explicitly and, and, and get the information I want. So what I want to see is a class of problems for which, I, which are important, for which I want to know the answer. I want, well, I want to find examples there where I can compute things. I, don't, I want to be able to use those examples to predict the generic behavior. Okay. Now the, um, the last thing I'm going to say here is that you see the the universality principle was, was really proven a long time after the, uh, the work of De Moivre. And in, in, in some problems that, that I will be talking about, the universality principle, even though it's, it's well conjectured, is unknown. And we don't know how long it's going to take for, for people to really find clues. But the integrable examples will provide some insight as to what's going on. So this is the, the preamble, the, the setup of what I'm going to talk about. And so the next, the next example that I want to talk about is uh, known under the name of random matrix theory. Um, random matrix theory was invented uh, by a statistician named Wishart in uh, um, 1928. This was the time of uh, development of multivariate statistics. And uh, he um, used random matrices to um, estimate sample covariance matrices. It's pretty remarkable that, that even now random matrices remain a um, very important tool in, in statistics, in, in big data, in, um, in machine learning. People usually use them in principal component analysis, but this is not something I'm going to talk about. I will instead look at the next place, chronologically next place, where random matrices appeared and made an impact. And that place is um, nuclear physics. So the, uh, um, the time is um, late 1940s, early 1950s. The um, radioactive materials and their properties are very important. And people collect a lot of um, experimental data which roughly looks like this. So this data is for what's called the uh, uh, neutron resonances. And the experiment naively looks as follows. One takes a, a nucleus that, that's supposed to be pretty heavy, something like uranium or thorium is the other one that's pictured there. And uh, it's been bombarded by, by neutrons. Neutrons could have high energy and low energy. So let's assume that they have reasonably low energy. Then the process is that the, um, the atom eats the, the, the neutron, keeps it for a while, and that spits it out. 
and, and that comes with energy, and that energy is quantized through a spectral level. And those spectral levels can be measured, and that's what, what the picture is, is, is giving. And there are many, and um, people could read them. But there was no theory that would say what those energies are or what they, they should be. And so the challenge was to describe, to describe the picture. There is nothing random about uranium or, or, or thorium. One can repeat the experiments. And yet there was an idea that the answer should really be described in statistical terms. The idea came from earlier work of Niels Bohr. And this is a, um, a picture I took from a paper of 1936 of, of his with a photograph of something he, um, he had as his house, as a wooden model for what he suggested is happening inside the atom. So the model is, is you can see this is a, um, like a plate um, with balls inside, and then there is a ball that's um, being thrown into that plate. If that ball is not, um, is not fast enough, then it's going to stick in that plate, and then uh, you know, something will happen in the plate, and then after a while, maybe a ball will come out. And so that's supposed to model the, uh, the um, atom that captures the, the slow neutral and then, and then shoots it out. And so Bohr suggested that really the, uh, the process should be described by the statistical properties of what's happening inside that plate with balls. Um, and that turned out to be a very good idea. So theoretically, the, those energy levels are, according to quantum mechanics, the um, eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, which is an operator in, um, in Hilbert, in an infinite dimensional space. And for big atoms, that, that Hamiltonian is hopelessly complicated. Nobody can really do that, find eigenvalues of this complicated object. So um, Eugene Wigner, one of the most prominent physicists in, of, of the 20th century, came around. And he said, OK, we don't know anything about that operator whose eigenvalues we want to look at. So let's instead just assume this Hamiltonian is random. And uh, this is a uh, quotation from, um, a Wigner's talk, from Wigner's talk in one of the conferences. Let me read it. Let me say only one word. It is very likely that the curve in figure one, okay, maybe I should say what the curve is figure one, in figure one is. So that curve is picturing the um, distance between neighboring levels, the histogram for um, the statistics of the distance between neighboring levels in, in, the, uh, um, in the experimental data. And so that histogram is the broken line over there. And so he says that the, the curve in figure one is a universal function in other words, it doesn't depend on the details of the model with which you're working. There is one particular model in which the probability of the energy levels can be written down exactly. It is called the Wisher distribution. So over there, in that sentence, there is a universality statement. And there is also a statement that there is an integrable example for which one can do things explicitly. Interestingly enough, the, uh, somebody asked him at the end of the talk, where does one find out about the Wisher distribution? And he says, a Wisher distribution is given in such and such book about statistics, and I found it just by accident. Now, that finding things by accident is actually pretty common. Okay, and that's one example where that works spectacularly. He was just looking through a book, and he thought that the, he could use that, that example in a way. So that example that I will explain in, on, on the next slide actually gives a match to the histogram, which is uh, the curve marked G, mark GOE. On that, on that picture. And so what is GOE? So what, what did Wigner invent to describe the energy levels of, of nuclear resonances? So this is a, um, a way to construct a random matrix, a random matrix with um, real spectra. So the eigenvalues need to be real, so the, the, the matrix is going to be either, either real symmetric or emission. And then uh, the uh, probability distribution that one puts on the matrix is, is, is this. It has the density e to the minus trace of the matrix squared. 
In other words, it means that the, the different matrix elements of the matrix are independent and, and Gaussian. Um, the good feature of this measure is that it is actually invariant with respect to rotations of the underlying space, right? If you conjugate the matrix, if it's real symmetric, and by, ortho by any orthogonal matrix, so if it's remission by any unitary matrix, that measure is not going to change, which was important for, for, um, well, for physical applications. And then the choice of um, whether one, one takes the real symmetric matrix or emission matrix is really dictated by, by physical relevance. There is a um, time invariance property and, and, and preservation of parity that, the, that there is in, in the original prog prog problem in nuclear physics. And when one imposes those properly, then it tells you which, which one of those one should, one, one should pick. So the, the, uh, the picture below is, is known under, Wigner, under the name of Wigner semicircle law. This is the histogram of the spectrum of the random emission, um, or actually, I'm not sure which one emission or, or real symmetric, but they are pretty similar. Um, and what Wigner discovered is that the, uh, the, uh, the eigenvalues, the histogram approaches the, the semicircle. Now, of course, that's not what he was interested in. In order to get to um, nuclear resonances, he needs to look in the bulk and look at the, at the distance between um, the nearest um, eigenvalues. And so the, uh, the distance between the nearest eigenvalues is a pretty complicated quantity. Wigner himself was not able to establish what it is. But once the idea is there, one can use um, numerics. One can just model the matrix on a computer, compute the spectrum, then, then make the plot and compare it to experiments. And that's what people did for you know, originally, and it matched. The, this slide is, is substantially more complicated than all the other slides in my talk. This is paying the debt to my mathematical background. This is the exact answer for, the, for this curve, right? For the curve that was matched to, to, to histogram over there, um, this is the uh, di distribution of the distance between nearest eigenvalues in, in the bulk. Um, it's only in 1980s that it, um, it was understood how to describe this curve analytically. Well, that's a little bit of a lie, but how to describe this, this, this curve in terms of a finite dimensional object, let me put it this way. So um, I'll just say what it is. One needs to solve a second order differential equation written over there. Um, it's a peculiar second order differential equation. It's nonlinear. And it actually was discovered much earlier in, in the beginning of, of 20th century by Paul Penlevé, who later became prime minister of France, um, for other reasons that I'm not going to go into. But this is a, a particular differential equation, which, which has global solution. You know, it's not clear if you write a nonlinear differential equation and try to solve it. The solution may not exist. But for this one, it does exist for some some, because of some properties of the equation. And so if one solves it with some initial condition, then one can cook up certain functions. And then, uh, then uh, one takes the exponential of this thing and then the second derivative, and that's what the plot is saying. So uh, there is also an expression for the same object in terms of um, an infinite dimensional determinant, so-called Fredholm determinant. So that, that was known in, in the 60s, and that people could also do. Do, um, do numerically. Okay, so um, again, the same philosophy, integrable example, explicit solution for the integrable example, and then the universality class that turns out to be so big that it even extends beyond probabilistic models, something like um, the um, uranium resonances. Right. Okay, so random matrices ended up being, being extremely successful. This is the result of the Google search on uh, random matrix theory on, in Google Scholar. So the first article is in numerical analysis. The second is quantum support. The third is wireless communications. The next one is quantum chromodynamics. The same is, is this one. This is classical analysis orthogonal polynomials. This is number theory, the distributions of zeros of, of, of zeta functions. Um, if, if you go further, there are a few, a few other examples there. So uh, random matrices turned out to be extremely universal. 
And I'll just pick uh, one more example out, out of that list where the universality can be nailed to an exact statement. Okay? So that statement um, is a statement of, um, of quantum chaos. So I'll try to explain what it is. One starts with a domain in, um, in, uh, in the plane. So the domain here is the square without the disk. Okay, so the disk is, has been taken out of the square. And so in that domain, one can play at billiard. Right? So playing billiard means you put a ball inside, shoot it, and then it goes around according to the usual laws of classical mechanics. So I'm going to assume that that, um, that billiard is chaotic. Now, it's, it's a, um, one needs to explain what chaotic means. And uh, let me just say that it's mixing enough so that if you run uh, a ball, then essentially from any, any ball you run will cover the whole domain fairly uniformly. There will be no preferred and, and empty areas. Okay? This domain is an example of such. This is known as Sinai's billiard after the work of of Sinai and, and Bunimovich in, in the 60s, who proved that this is um, reasonably chaotic. And so then one, one turns this billiard into a quantum one. So the, 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 the ball needs to be turned into a quantum particle. What it means? Well, mathematically, it just means that uh, one looks at the um, Laplace operator in this domain, puts, let's say, zero boundary conditions. It's not that important. And then looks at the spectrum of the, of the Laplace in, in, in this domain. And you may see some um, parallelism with the random matrix example where there was also an operator in its spectrum. So you know, we have an operator in the spectrum, except for now the operator is, is very concrete. It's just the Laplacian. It's sort of the simplest operator you can find. The domain is also very concrete. And so if one looks high enough into the spectrum, um, there is a certain um, law that in the first approximation gives you the distribution of the eigenvalues. It's, it's due to Hermann Weyl and then the correction to, to cuts. And so if one sort of rescales according to that law sort of the, so, so that the, the average distance between eigenvalues becomes one and then plots the histogram of the distances between nearest neighbors, then this, this is the histogram one, one will see. And this is the GOE curve and it matches that pretty well. So these numerical experiments were done in the 80s. And so this is a conjecture from a paper in 1984 that whenever one has a domain where the billiard is chaotic, the spectrum of the Laplacian in that domain is supposed to give the random matrix statistics for the, for the near, well, for many things in particular for the nearest neighbor spacing. It's a beautiful conjecture. I think there were, I'm pretty sure there were a number of numerical experiments that, 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 that confirmed that to a certain extent. Nobody has any idea how to prove it. There is not a single case where this thing is proven. But again, this is a, this is a clean example of, way of the universality that should be there, but no integrability, at least not, not yet. I'll proceed with my examples. And so the next example will uh, be better in the sense that there will be integrable representative and, and, and representatives. And that's what I will focus um, on later. And also this example brings me back to the, to the game with, with blocks that I started with. So remember I was building a tower of blocks with one by one by one cubes. So now I'll try to increase those slides were called zero dimensional growth because the space was zero dimensional. Everything was, was, was built on top of the single spot. So now I'll try to spread it around. I'll add the dimension um, in, in space. So if I just do it in a, in a, in a silly way, if I just start, being se start, start building several towers and then I'll have boxes thrown onto each of the towers independently and the towers don't talk to each other, well, so that's, that's um, and then if I simulate it, that's the picture that one gets. So the picture, um, so this is, let's say, the first thousand boxes, then you add the next thousand, and it's, a, it's the black thing that's added, and, and so on. And then, of course, al along every column, you get the same old tower that you had before. So the fluctuations of this interface is of the size square root of time. Um, and, you know, there is nothing new in this picture. Okay. 
Now, um, then one can modify the game to, to take um, advantage of the fact that we have an extra dimension. So uh, the picture here is, um, is done with a procedure that fills the, fills the holes. So when the boxes fall randomly, what, what each box is doing when it's landing, it looks left and right. It picks the lowest location or you know, any of two or three if there are several. Um, and puts itself there. Okay. So that fills the holes a little bit. And if one runs the simulation, this is the picture one gets, and it's drastically more smooth than this one. Okay. And then the third procedure over there is the boxes fall down. And so when they fall, the recipe is that now they become sticky. And so if they touch a box on the side, they just stick. And then they, um, they, 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 then one runs the simulation and, and you know, it goes. And uh, the, uh, you see this interface is probably not as smooth as this one, but much smoother than, than, than that one. And then, of course, there are some holes in, in, in between, which I don't care about. So if one, um, if one does it on a computer, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to find out that. So this is, again, t to the half, square root of t fluctuations that we knew about. This is pretty, pretty clearly, again, from numerical simulations, what it should be. The fluctuations are of size um, root t. Uh, sorry, um, fourth degree root t, so t to the power one quarter. And here, one observes the, the cubic root of t fluctuations, the, uh, um, the pretty exponents that, that one would probably want to explain. Um, physicists also came up with um, differential equations with, um, with randomness that are supposed to describe Similar, similar growth models, but um, and you can look at them. They're, they're over there, along with the names of the physicists that, that were first to suggest them, but I, I'm not going to talk, talk about them much. These are beautiful answers. Are there universality classes around them? The universality classes were sort of suggested by the physicists that that came up with those equations. So I'll, I'll talk more about this example here, um, Kardar, Parisi, and Zhang. So in, um, in their paper in 1986, they suggested a universality class for growth models that's supposed to produce every time the fluctuations of size t to the one third. And hopefully the models in that class will also share other, other properties, not just the um, the fluctuation exponent. So what are, how, how do they define um, the class? The class is defined by, uh, by three properties. So first property is the locality of growth. If you have an interface and it's growing randomly at different places, the growth at distant places has to be independent. It shouldn't have much to do with each other. Which I, um, well, I sort of, um, um, I sort of secretly meant by saying that the boxes fall randomly. So whatever happens here doesn't have much to do with whatever happens here. Now there has to be um, a smoothing mechanism. There has to be some mechanism of filling the holes. Because if there, if, if there isn't any, then there will be very thin fingers and very deep holes growing, and that's something we, we don't want. And the third property is that the, the interface should grow sideways. That's hard to, um, to predict somehow, but, but in, in more plain language, the speed, with the average speed with which the interface should grow is going to depend on the slope of the interface. If it's flat, it's going to with one speed, and if it's very steep, it's going to grow up with a different speed. That's automatic if you imagine that the, if the, if you imagine that the interface is really growing in, in the normal direction. So that's called the, the late lateral growth. or Because then if it grows in this direction, the vertical component of the speed is smaller. Right? And so basically what they said is that if these three quantities are there, if these three qualities are there, then the models are supposed to be similar. If one drops, so um, this model enjoys all three of them. I mean, this one only enjoys one, the locality of growth. There is no smoothing mechanism, um, and there is no sideways growth. This one enjoys two. There is a locality of growth, there is a smoothing mechanism, but the speed of growth is actually independent of the slope. It doesn't matter what the interface here is doing, the, uh, 
the vertical speed of growth will be, will be the same. And you see the, the universality class is, is, is clearly different. Yeah. What is the smoothing mechanism on, on the right when, when you show right. the, the block falling? There didn't seem to be a so, so if there is a hole that's developing here, there is, a, there is a good chance that it will be covered by something growing sideways from, from the side. And so this hole is going to get covered. And if you look from top, it's no longer a hole. So I always read off the interface as seen from the top. So you can't read, I mean, you can have holes in here, but from the top, they're going to be covered. You don't develop deep holes. That's the smoothing mechanism. The smoothing mechanism can really take different shapes in, in different models. There will be another one later that where the smoothing mechanism is, is different again. But the key is you should have a mechanism preventing the, you know, the wells the, the, or, the, or the fingers that will grow straight. It's not the absence of holes. It's, it's the absence of holes when you look from the side. That's right. From the point of view of the interface when looked from um, the top. Okay, so that was the, um, so physicists had, um, had a good idea why, the, um, why the, the fluctuation exponent is supposed to be t to the one third. From a point of view of mathematician, the, the idea was um, still a tough sell. But uh, they had numerical experiments, you know, how can you beat good experiments? If they, if they check a few, a few models, it works, they, they come up with arguments, you know, probably correct. But mathematicians had something to say about, about these models, and so the progress happened later. The progress happened um, um, in, in, in late 90s. Now, what, the, what happened really is that mathematicians found integrable examples of models in, in, in that class. Unlike quantum chaos, which I showed with billiards, something happened when the integrable examples appeared. The integrable examples provided much more control over what's happening. And hence, if one believes in universality, much more information about the rest of the models in the class. So uh, let me try to explain one integrable example. So the integrable example uh, that's, that's um, on this picture, it's um, called the polynuclear growth. And so I'll, I'll explain it in words and then I'll show a simulation. So the, the process is the following. There is a flat, originally there is a flat surface. You can think of two dimensions or one dimension. I'll, I'll, I'll look at one dimension here. And then there are um, nucleation seeds that are falling from the sky. And once the nucleation seed falls, there is an island that starts growing from that place and it grows in all directions um, at the same time. Um, so here is my interface. And then randomly there are these nucleation seeds that, that go down and then land somewhere. And then once, once it's there, it starts expanding left and right with some constant speed. And that happens with these walls as well. And when the two walls meet, they merge. Okay? This is a space, this is a simulation <coughs> in the space-time picture. So this section is a fixed time uh, thing. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's easier to show um, a cartoon, and if my computer cooperates, um, I'll do that. So the, the, red, the red line here is the interface, and it will start moving. Don't look below for, for now. Just look at the red line, and something will start happening under this. So you see the, there, are, there are islands that appear, and then when the two islands meet, they, they merge, and then equation seeds appear, appear randomly. So this is, uh, this is a growth model. It has a locality mechanism. The nucleation seeds land independently in different locations. It has a smoothing mechanism. It clearly, clear, it, it clearly covers the holes. And then it also grows sideways. Right? So the, um, the good thing is that one can really analyze this one. So before going into, into the analysis, I'll, I'll also explain this picture here. So this is, this is the picture of the same process in, in space-time. And, and I will want to think about the events of new seeds that appear 
as uh, points in space-time. And so when the seed appears, the walls start expanding left and, left and right, and that gives rise to these rays in the space-time picture. So these are the, the traces of the two walls. And when the two walls meet, they merge, and that's why these two rays annihilated each other over there. I hope this picture is clear. So this section over there, that's a fixed time section. That's what you're going to see um, as an interface over there. Okay. So here is a theorem um, proven by um, 98, actually proven for, for, for a change. That if one measures the height of this interface at, at large time and then subtracts the speed, this is the speed of growth, and then divides by t to the one third, the correct predicted exponents. And then one looks at the distribution of the fluctuation. Then that distribution is coming from random matrices. Why it should be coming from random matrices at this moment probably is completely unclear, as it should be. It was completely unclear when this result came out of why random matrices should have anything to do with this growth model. It was a complete surprise. So what is this exactly? Well, so one looks at the same uh, model, the, the, um, the coming from Wigner, of random matrices with the Gaussian weights, and actually not necessarily Gaussian, uh, and then one looks at the top eigenvalue of the matrix. Not the distance between neighbors and the bulk, but the very top one, the edge of the matrix. That's not something that physicists were interested in originally. That has nothing to do with, with, with nuclear resonances, at least uh, not that I know of. And so then there is a, a scaling. I mean, then one just looks at its fluctuations. There is a low flush numbers. That's the edge of the semicircle. Um, there, is a there is a fluctuation exponent, and so then there is a distribution that appears there. It was first founded by Tracy Whittam. See, the, these are early 90s. This is much later than the original work by Wigner, is because Wigner had, had no interest in, in, in the edge. Um, and so this, um, the easiest way to, to describe this distribution is, again, to solve a nonlinear second order differential equation, although here, it's simpler. It's also, uh, it's another Penleve equation. It was also found by, by Paul Penleve, and, and, and it's simpler in, in this particular case. Okay, so um, how large is this universality class? Does it have a chance of being as useful as, as um, what Wigner suggests? In recent years, there were several experiments that produced objects behaving as this um, as interfaces in, 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 in this class. So the, um, the most um, accurate one comes from um, phase transition in, uh, in pneumatic liquid crystals, and, and uh, um, it's pretty spectacular. It's done, it was done by, by two Japanese physicists, um, Takeuchi and Sano, but I, I haven't put it there. What I put there, is something much more mundane and also something I, I, I had a direct connection with. Um, yeah, I, for both reasons, I like it more. Um, and that's the example that probably all of us have seen in, in, in real life. So what, the, what's, th this, is, this is a coffee stain. Okay? So this is, this is coffee that has been spilled on the countertop and then uh, not cleaned in time. It dries out, and the feature uh, that um, people probably noticed before is that it has a dark rim. A tea stain would not have a dark rim. That's because coffee particles, coffee particles are much larger than, than larger than tea particles. It's a colloidal suspension. And so when the evaporation happens, uh, coffee particles, they uh, by convection floor, uh, by co um, convection uh, flow, they get pushed to the border. Then that then get they they get piled to the border. Now this is very this is time, well time is growing from here to here. This is the increase of time, and so the amount of water is lower, right? That's how the rim appears. 
Th these are, these are state-of-the-art experiments for, let's say, four, four years ago. This is pretty difficult to do this time of, of photography, and it's only recently that, that soft matter experimentalists were able to do it. And so um, it's sort of immediate once, once you see that, and, and you've seen what I showed before, uh, the question should be whether this packing procedure has something to do with the, with the interface growth that, that I showed before. And it, it seemed to. So the experiments have been done, and um, not on coffee, but on manufactured coffee, right? So the coffee has the problem that all particles are irregular, they're different, right? So one needs to manufacture the particles so that they, should, they would be standard. And uh, the interesting thing is that if one manufactures those particles to be perfectly round, then the fluctuations of this interface are Gaussian, and uh, they have a size root t, where time actually is not real time, but the height of this interface, okay? So the root of the height. And so that seems contradictory to the, the su su suggested KPZ uh, thing, uh, but if one makes longer particles, if one takes ellipsoids with aspect ratio not too large, 1.2, 1.3, then the statistics of the interface becomes um, KPZ type, t to the one third, and and one can even sort of um, guess the, um, the random matrix distribution, this, the Tracy Witham distribution, um, show, showing up. So. Um, so good, it's not, complete, it's not a completely um, theoretical game, hopefully. All right, now um, I'm, I'm getting closer to, to the question of why one, um, first of why this example was so well hidden, and second, why random matrices should have anything to do with, uh, with the growing interfaces, okay? So the first thing um, on my path to some answers will be to make the problem harder, which is uh, surprisingly often beneficial in, in, in math. So instead of this is my, uh, this is my model uh, that I had before, right? The polynuclear growth, the interface is growing, things are falling and expanding. Now, instead of one broken line, I'm going to draw many, okay? And the way I'm going to do it is the following. First, I will start with many lines which are flat and just sitting one below the other. I'll show the cartoon in a second. I'll first explain in words. And then what will happen is that when two islands merge, I will consider that as a nucleation event on the next level. Okay? So I will keep track of, the, of all the information in the system. Rather than just merging the islands and losing the information, I will keep it by propagating it one level down and expanding it over there. And then when the two islands merge in the second line, go third and, you know, and so on. And so that results in, 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 in a picture like that. There is also a, um, an interpretation of that picture um, in different words that, that I'll, I'll, I should probably mention. So the interpretation is that if I look at the space-time picture like that, and so the, the black dots there are the nucleation events. They are these corners. And so these are the rays, and so these are the annihilation when two things, uh, when two walls merge, they, they disappear. But then, um, and then the height in this picture is computed as the number of these paths I cross when I go from the corner to whatever my observation location is, and here it's four. So now, instead of just looking at that picture, I consider the annihilation points in space-time as new nucleation events. And so then I repeat the same procedure, and then the annihilation points are new nucleation events, and then I repeat the same procedure. And so now instead of the one height four, I'm getting four, three, two, one, and these correspond to the positions of these uh, black dots over there. So I'll, I'll show the, uh, the cartoon, hopefully. Let's see, over there. So here are my several lines. And uh, the top one is the, is the one we are most interested in. And so it starts growing. And now you see when two things merge on the top, that gives something on the bottom. And when then two things merge on the second lower level, this gives something below, and so on. Okay. And so I can speed it up. And, uh, and I get something. Okay. So why do I care? 
Well, okay, I should go back to the slides. I care because these multiple lines, they actually give more eigenvalues of the random matrix. Now I said that the, the behavior of the top line uh, models the behavior of the largest eigenvalue of the random matrix. So if I now consider all the lines together, they model first, second, third, fourth, and so on eigenvalues. As many as you like, because the matrix is large and looking at the edge, I'll see you know, infinitely many, in fact, in, in the limit. So that's, that's better. So I not just, I'm, I'm not seeing just a single eigenvalue, I'm, I'm seeing more of a matrix. So that's, that's getting me closer, hopefully. Okay, so the next step is, is going to get me even closer. If I look at the distribution, at the probability to observe a particular sequence of heights of level one, two, three, and so on, and if I compute that probability, so this here is, is a closed answer for this probability. And let me go through it slowly. So the first part of the answer is elementary. This is just a Poisson distribution with parameter t squared. There is nothing really there. Now, the interesting thing is hidden here. This dim lambda is the, um, the dimension of the reducible representation of the symmetric group parameterized by lambda. So let me spell it up. Let me spell it out. So the symmetric group is the group of all permutations of n symbols. That group has representations as linear operators, which means that there is a way of mapping that group into linear operators in some space, some vector space, so that the product of two permutations goes into the product of two linear operators in that, in that space. The simplest way to do it is just the permutations can permute coordinates of a given um, n-dimensional vector. Okay, that's a representation. It's a, it's a so-called tautological one. It's a simple one, but there are many more. And so the, and then one can look for all possibilities to do that. It's a classical problem. It goes back to the year of 1900 where, when it was solved. All possibilities are parameterized by these sequences of weakly decreasing integers that add up to n. These are called partitions of n. And the dimensions of those representations, so the dimensions of those spaces where the operators live, they can be computed by, by a fairly neat procedure. This here is, um, is called the Young graph after Reverend Young, who, who did a lot of work on that in, uh, well, in, in, in the late 19th century. And so this is, this is a branching of these staircases um, that are built by, by standard blocks you know, by adding them one by one. And so if you compute the number of paths that goes from the root to a particular location, the location encodes numbers lambda one, lambda two, and so on by just reading the number of boxes in the first row, second, so this is three, one, and, and that's it. And then these numbers are these dimensions. This is what sits there, okay? The, um, this needs to be a probability distribution. What it means is that these numbers, they all add up to one. And that's a problem uh, that's good actually for recreational math. It's not too hard and it's not trivial. If you draw this, this graph, you compute the number of um, paths that go from the root to that vertex. Here they are. And if you sum the squares of these numbers in any column, you get a perfect factorial. Okay, so one plus four plus one, this is six, and these add up to, to 24. This comes from a fact in representation theory, uh, but um, one doesn't need to know that, one can just take that and, and, and prove that. So there is structure. What, there is structure beneath this, the, the, the random growth model that was completely invisible from, from the very beginning. And that is the structure that's actually responsible for both the fact that mathematicians were the first to find the model by accident, and also for the fact that the model is solvable. Still, it's not an explanation for a random matrix. It's not random matrix yet, right? So my, my final example will be a more powerful growth model that will put random matrices on the same 
floor as a growth model. Okay? So this, this, this growth model is a growth model in two plus one dimensions. So now I'll have a two-dimensional interface that's, uh, that's growing in, in three space. My initial condition is going to be this. So these are two flat planes that, that, that meet at the, at the right angle. And I will picture this by, um, by the picture on the right. Hopefully you can imagine that this is one plane, this is the other plane. And I'll place, um, I'll place particles in the, in the centers of my um, vertical rhombi, and it's easier for me to first explain what happens in terms of these particles. So I'm trying to define a growth model in, in, in two plus one dimensions. Okay. Now, uh, in order for me to evolve these particles, I'll imagine that they have an importance ranking. The one at the bottom is the big boss. It's, it's going to evolve not caring about everything else. These two are smaller bosses. They will only pay attention to the big boss and so on. And so the dynamics is that these particles will now jump to the right independently of each other. Let's say with exponential waiting time or maybe with probability half every second. And so this one will just do the random walk. It will jump like the tower I was building before. And then these ones will do the same, but they will pay attention. So whenever this one um, will try to overcome the boss, the jump is not going to happen. And whenever this one goes, but this one doesn't want to, it's going to be pushed. These, uh, maybe instead of going through the slides, I'll, I'll show the, um, the cartoon of how this is happening. The cartoon, the cartoon is over here. No, this is the wrong picture. This is the right picture. This is my initial condition. And so this, this, is the, the, this is how they evolve. So particle decides to jump, and then there are a bunch of those that, that prevent it from going. And if, if those are above, it just pushes it over. But these ones, for example, cannot jump before the one that's on the bottom and to the right will, will go. Okay? So this is a, um, for now, this is just a, a bunch of particles that are um, jumping in, in um, in the plane, but there is also a way to draw this picture three-dimensionally, and then um, this will be really a way of um, adding cubes or removing cubes from a, uh, um, a three-dimensional surface. Okay. So this is uh, um, again, as we uh, as as we will see, this is an integrable example now of a growth model in two plus one dimensions but it will contain the one plus one dimensional one as, as, a, as, a, as its section. So if I concentrate on um, the leftmost side of my array of particles, then these will actually evolve independently. They will not care about the rest at all. And the way that they will evolve is known as um, the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. So that's many words. That's usually abbreviated as a TASEP. And it's a simple model for traffic on a freeway. There are these particles live on the lattice. So I took that line. I just put it like that. And so these particles, they jump to the right independently of each other, except for when the particle, when there is another particle in the place where this one is supposed to go, the jump cannot happen. So these are cars on the freeway. If there is some distance between your car and the next car, you might want to push the gas pedal and come close a little bit with some probability, but you probably don't want to run into the car that's right in front of you. So this is a growth model in one plus one dimension. I claim it's in KPZ class. It has the three properties. Uh, well, first of all, why this is an interface model? Well, I, I can, I can uh, encode the particles by the broken line where to each particle I assign a segment of slope minus one and to each hole I assign a segment of length one. Um, and then the dynamics that I just described is the dynamics of putting boxes independently at all possible local minima of this broken line. So this is a growth model. It has the locality. Things that happen here have nothing to do with what's happening there. It has a um, relaxation property. Now, why is that? 
the relaxation is hidden in the definition of the model itself. It is, it is modeled by things of slope one and minus one. It can never have deep holes. That's the relaxation mechanism. And then finally, um, the fact that it has uh, lateral growth is actually easy to check. If the interface is, is almost slope one or slope minus one, there, is very few, there are very few positions where you can put a new thing. And if it's flat, there are many positions when you could. So it's a KPZ class um, model. Um, I also have a simulation of it, but maybe I'll, 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 I'll pass on that. And so um, this model should have the same asymptotics as, um, as the polynuclear growth, as, uh, as any other model in, in the same class. And so it came up, again, as a section of my two plus one dimensional one. On the other hand, if I take another section of the same picture, now I take a horizontal section. So now I take the section horizontally. Then I want, if I look at the distribution of those particles at the horizontal section, then that distribution has a lot to do with representation theory that I mentioned before. Namely, what it has to do with is that one takes a tensor space of large, of, of, of large degree. In this tensor space, the two groups are acting. One group is the group of um, um, invertible matrices of size n capital by n capital that rotates the c to the n space. The other group is the symmetric group that permutes the tensor factors. This is known as the Schur-Weil representation. So we have two groups acting in a big space. One can decompose that big tensor space into pieces, where each piece is an irreducible representation. What it means is that you cannot decompose further so that your group action would stay in the, in the, in the individual component. This is sort of the maximal decomposition into pieces. So that's good. And so now I, I, I recap. This is TASEP. This is a KPZ model. This is a representation theoretic object. The decomposition, this is called the problem of non-commutative harmonic analysis. A decomposition of a given representation onto reducible components. The harmonic analysis has something called the semi-classical limit. That's when representation theory of classical groups turns into measures on the corresponding Lie algebra. The Lie algebra is going to be Hermitian matrices, essentially, and measures on Hermitian matrices are random matrices. So the large, the large time, or if one wants to say large energy limit of this object is random matrices. And the large time behavior of TASEP is the KPZ class. So this picture there connects the two worlds. The random matrices really should be describing the object in the KPZ class. Now this, is, this comes from a very, very specific model in the KPZ class. The pleasure of that model is that it admits this extension. It admits this picture. Of course, if you take an arbitrary model, if you twist one little thing in your original model, this whole thing will be destroyed. But the integrable example somehow captures first the symmetries of the, the classical groups and second, the asymptotics that we want for the universality class. Now, as I said, the, um, the, origin, the model that I started with is two plus one dimensional. And so the next question should be, What's, what happens there? Is the universality class there? What, what surfaces can you grow with, with that dynamics? And there are answers to those questions. There is a, there is a universality class there, and one can grow surfaces. Um, these are examples of some of the surfaces uh, one could grow. I'll just maybe say one thing about this surface there. Um, the way that one can get the surface is not to, um, I guess I'm advertising not being, um, very neat. Uh, first spilling coffee and then not cleaning your room too well. So this, uh, this picture here is a corner of, of a room in which one puts tiny one by one by one boxes. And then one piles them, you know, a lot of them, zillion. And then one, one does it randomly so that the distribution one gets on this uh, dust pile 
is uniform on all possibilities. And then one sees that there is a, there, there is a limit shape that arises. There is a, a beautiful surface there um, that's related to something ca called amoeba of a, of a complex line. And it, this can be grown with the type of the dynamics I, I've shown. It's one of the integrable examples of the dynamics. So I'll, I'll, I'll come to, to the summary. So the first point is that universality is a very powerful idea. I'm sure everybody in this room has seen it in, in, in one way or the other. It tells you what circles of systems or models should have the same behavior. Right? Universality is usually very well guessed by numerical analysts and by physicists. They just run the thing and they see when the plots are similar, right? Still, it's an art. One needs to make the right assumptions on the model to see what happens. Proving universality is much more challenging. In the demarv laplace example, it took, what, 150 years to get to the proof. Now, there are many examples now in which universality is conjectured and well supported by numerical evidence. The proofs are just not there. You know, even the understanding of where the proofs should be coming from are not there, and every success of that form is, is a major advance, in fact. Sometimes people get lucky by finding representatives in universality classes that have special features. And those features are powerful enough to, tell, to, to give you the answers to whatever questions you want to know. These special features, at least in the, in the situations that, that I came across, often come from extra symmetries. Like in random matrices, the, 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 unitary, the, the unitary orthogonal invariance of the ensemble of random matrices. In growth models, the connection to representation theory. Some structure is hidden there, and that structure typically comes from a classical symmetry group or from its representations, or from some other object related to the classical symmetry group. And so putting together that symmetry, leveraging it to extract the probabilistic information really gives one the tools to extract the universal um, features and predict things that are happening throughout the universality class. So those are the ideas that I tried to illustrate. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you.